and a great truth, a great warning. He, he came on that Bethlehem morning, and he's coming again. And it may be sooner than most of us uh, realize. As I said, I want to ring out the old year and ring in the new year with a, a focus on growth, growing. And uh, we're going to talk first this morning about the plan of growing. And we see that here in 2 Peter chapter 1. And basically the truth that we want to look at this morning together is that if you are born again, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've been born again, you already have everything you need to live life and to grow in godliness. That's what the scripture says here. That's the truth today. And, uh, and let's say this together. I'll say it first and then we'll say it together. Uh, I have all I need. Can you say that with me? I have all I need. Uh, in Jesus Christ and in his word and by his spirit who lives with, we have all that we need. That's the truth today. That's the plan of growing. Uh, uh, how many of you have ever eaten peeps? You know what? You know, that's a, that's a, a modern young persons or whatever new language for people. But, but I'm talking about, you know, the peeps. You know, at Easter, they, they come out in the stores, you know, in the grocery store. You know what peeps are? Everybody know what peeps are? Um, well, how many, how many of you uh, uh, like to eat peeps? Some of us don't, but I tell you, if you if you're if you're a sh sugar lover, I mean, <laughs> peeps are, are pretty. You know, they, they they they're real pretty. Some of them are yellow, some of them are pink, and uh, and I think they taste good. But you know, they're not good for you. <laughs> they're not good for you. If if you had to live on peeps, you'd be in trouble. Uh, they they taste good. They're sweet, uh, but they really don't have a lot of substance or uh, to them. Well. What God is trying to teach us or remind us of today is that he wants us to make sure we're putting the right things in us so that we can grow in our faith. And uh, you know, you, you, you're never really standing still, by the way. In your Christian life, in, in, as a Christ follower today, you, you are either moving forward, and that's what we want to do, don't we, in this new year. We want to, or you're kind of just... Uh, <laughs> Drifting, or, or, you're, or you're moving away or backward. Uh, you're, you're not standing still. Uh, uh, life is a, uh, and especially spirit, spiritual life, is, is, is a dynamic. And you know this book, uh, the second Peter, it really packs a punch. A lot of preachers uh, jump over it, and we're going to get into it eventually. Uh, we're in 1 Peter. We'll be going back to that after this series to finish up 1 Peter, and then we'll be getting into it. But, but this, uh, if you read it, it reads kind of like a farewell speech of the, from, from the Apostle Peter to, to those uh, who were following the Lord. And, and uh, you know, it's a good book to study, and we're going to study it. We're going to look at it. It helps us to grow in our faith, and that's really what we're going to be about. You've probably seen these four words that we're going to be looking at and focusing on as a congregation uh, this next year in 2020. It's uh, four G's. Gather, uh, grow, give, and go. That's what we're about here at, at Temple, is we're, we're, we're to gather together. You know, sometimes back in uh, March and April, we didn't get to do it like this. We had to Zoom it, you know, and all that. But we gathered. Uh, we're to gather together, and then we're to grow in our faith, and we're to seek to reach others and grow in our numbers. And then we're to give, and then we're to go with the gospel. And so we're going to be focusing these next, uh, beginning today and these next four Sundays, on growing. Uh, 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, this book, when we get into it, it, it equips us to deal with error. That's really what it's talking about here. Uh, 1 Peter deals with, with hostility from without. Persecution, the church, they, the folks were, uh, in 1 Peter, as we've already been seeing, were, were being uh, persecuted from, from without. But 2 Peter deals with heresy, uh, 
false uh, teaching from within. And uh, as we get closer, as, as Pam just sang, as we get closer to the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we need to be aware that error and false teaching are going, are going to accelerate. If you'll look at chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, notice what Peter says. But there are also false uh, prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift uh, destruction. And I believe that that causes us to cherish the return of Jesus Christ. You see, you see that's the hope, folks. I sure hope you're not putting your hope in, in the United States government. I think I hope we've learned that. Um, we, we live in a, in a blessed country. But folks, our hope, our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ and his soon return because he's coming back. <laughs> he's, it's sure, there's more in the Bible about the second coming of Jesus than the first. You heard me say that many times, but that's true. If Jesus Christ, the historical Jesus Christ, who came and was born in Bethlehem that we've sung about and celebrated these, this time of year, God, God in human flesh, the Messiah, promised for thousands... If he came the first time, he, in the Bible, pro prophesied. But there's more in the Bible about the second coming. If he came the first time, you're guaranteed folks, he's coming again. And the signs are lining up. And so uh, we should cherish the second coming of, of Jesus Christ. And since we're living in these last days, we need to be ready for his return. And we need to be motivated to share our faith with as many people as we can. Uh, check out chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4. Listen to what he says here. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And then verse 10 of that saying, he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Brother Wayland, Jesus is going to come it says, it's like a thief in the night. Like a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Folks, don't focus on your stuff because it's going to be gone. You know, we spend so much of our time and worry and energy about our stuff. This, this whole world is going to be burned up. Scoffers are going to come. People are going to say, you know, it's been like that for all. But, you know, it, it, it encourages us, doesn't it? The fact that Jesus comes back encourages us to persevere, doesn't it? Keep going. Keep on going when we don't want to go. Peter warns us against falling away. In that third chapter, in the 17th verse, this is what he says. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. You know, there, there, there are so many trends, but, but there's two recent trends, especially here in our country, that make us discouraged and tempt us to fall away. And I'll be preaching on this in a couple of three or four Sundays after this. And that's the redefinition of marriage. You know, we, we are in the midst of a huge cultural um, uh, shift in matters of faith and, and family and freedom. Doctor, I like what Dr. Al Mohler, the president of Southern Seminary, said this. I want to quote what he said. The vast high-velocity moral revolution that is reshaping modern culture at warp speed is leaving almost no aspect of our culture untouched and unchanged. And a good example of this was an article that was written in Time magazine called The Writings on the Wall for Christians. The Writings on the Wall for Christians. In that, in that article, uh, the writer, the author, talks about uh, LGBTQ rights um, 
And here's what he, and I quote, here's what he said in that article. Church leaders must be made to take homosexuality off the sin list. And then he goes on and suggests the Bible should be rewritten to be more accepting of this community. Because if you read the Bible, it's pretty clear, folks. I don't understand some folks who are Christ followers who, who, who uh, can't read. But the Bible is so clear on this. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to judge people. That doesn't mean we don't need to love all people, no matter All of us are sinners. It's just which sin you, you focus on, amen? All of us. We don't need, I'm not saying we should do that. I'm just saying there is truth. He also called for a ban on gay conversion therapy. And I think some states already have done that. But uh, we're going to continue to face um, opposition from, from outside forces, folks. And I believe increasingly inside pressure to cave in for, for churches and pastors and, and Christians, Christ followers, to cave into the culture. Of course, the other, other big trend throughout the world, but it's really here in America, and it's what I, what, what I would call and what Dr. Mo, uh, Moeller calls apocalyptic uh, Islamic uh, theology. When commenting on the killing of 148 Christians by the Al-Shabaab in Kenya, one journalist said this, Attacks against Christians are not just terrorism, but religious warfare. You see, this group, along with other Islamic extremists, have promised that they're going to kill more and more Christians throughout the world, and it's happening, folks. All you have to do is just pick up the newspaper. Most people don't pick up newspapers anymore, but read the news. And what Peter is doing here is he, he's, he's about to depart. We know that this is right, he wrote this letter right before he died. Uh, we know that he died about a year after he wrote this second letter. And he's very concerned for believers to hold on to what is true. And he said false teachers, false teachers have, have been spreading dangerous doctrine and persecution. And it was so prevalent. And the second generation of believers had lost their spiritual passion, apparently, and, and as that's common. We see that even here in America today. So many Christians have lost their, their passion for, for the Lord. We just kind of go through the motions. They come, we come to church, but we just, it's, we're just, it's kind of out of habit. And, and that's what, his purpose in writing this whole letter is to remind Christ followers that the gospel changes lives and that discipleship involves discipline and that spiritual growth is, is not automatic. <laughs> it's intentional. You have to be, in, if you want to grow folks in the Lord, if you want to be a growing Christian, you've got to be intentional. It doesn't just happen automatically. And that's what Peter is saying here. And so this pa passage challenges us in at least three ways. Uh, first of all, Notice that you must first know who you are. Who, know who you are. You say, well, I know who I am. I'm so-and-so. No, I'm talking about know who you are in Christ. Know who you are as a follower of Christ. First century letters began with the names and qualifications of the one sending the letter. And if you notice here, he starts to hit off his letter different from he did, what he did in 1 Peter. In 2 Peter, he says, Simon Peter. In the first letter, he just says Peter, an apostle. But here he says, Simon Peter. Peter, he describes himself with a couple of names and titles because he knew who he was. And by looking at them uh, carefully, we can learn who we are if, we're, if you're a Christ follower. The first, thing, first one is you're a sinner. I've already said that, but that's what he says here. Simon Peter, simple Simon, you know. Simple Simon was always putting his foot in his mouth. If you read the Gospels, he was always saying things he shouldn't say, like some of us. Simon was what Jesus called Peter when he was being 
selfish or sinful. We see this in Luke 22. In uh, Luke 22, 31 and 32, you can look up on the screen if you don't have it there on your Bible. And the Lord said to, to, to Simon, <laughs> to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen the brethren. It's important to admit that we are all still sinners saved by grace. Every one of us. And as Paul would say, I'm, I'm one of the worst. We're, we're all sinners. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So know who you are. You're a sinner. But notice, secondly, you're a saint too. Peter. It means uh, stone or rock. His name, his real name was Simon, but, but, but Jesus uh, called him Peter. Um, you see, he's more than just a sinner. If, if you're a Christ follower, you're more than just a sinner. You're also a saint. But the Bible calls believers saints. Jesus said that about Peter. Uh, Matthew uh, 16, verse 18. Notice what he says. And I also say to you that you are Peter. He called him Simon, Simon, but he said, But I also say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Yes, Peter was a sinner, but he was also a saint. And we're all a, a bit like this, aren't we? Sometimes we slide into uh, sinful habits, even when we're striving to live out our position as, as a saint one of the followers of Jesus. So know who you are. You're a sinner. You're a saint. And then he uses this word. Simon Peter, a bond servant. You know that word actually literally is a word slave? Slave. One who serves without regard of his personal interests. So if you're a follower of Jesus today, let me tell you. Who are you? You're a sinner. You're also a saint. And you are a servant. You're a slave of Jesus. And then he called himself apostle. Now we know that there are no officially, there's no apostles left on, on this earth. But officially, that word apostle actually means officially commissioned messenger. One who is sent forth. And while there's no apostles today, in a real sense, you and I are as followers of Jesus, we've been sent. What did Jesus say to his disciples after he had risen? As my Father has sent me, what? So send I you. You've been sent. You've been sent out into the world. And that's what we do. I hope you notice that when you drive out of our driveway. What does that sign say out there when you drive out? Has anybody noticed it? Yeah. You're entering a mission field. We've all been sent. We've all been sent. We're sinners, we're saints, we're servants, and we've all been sent. And we've been called to gather and to grow and to give and to go with the gospel. And because we've been told to go, we're to live as one who has been sent. So do you know who you are? Peter says, if you want to move forward, if you want to grow this year, Brother John, know who you are. In Jesus Christ. Secondly, know where you stand. Know where you stand. He said, I'm writing to those who have obtained like precious faith. Here's where we stand. You have obtained faith. Did you know that even your faith is a gift of God? <laughs> even the faith that you put your trust in Jesus, that's actually a gift of God. That's what the Bible says. Even your faith is a gift of God. Jude chapter 3 says, uh, verse 3 says that, that we have a common salvation. Huh. That's what he's talking about. He says, here he, says, he calls it like precious faith. We have like precious faith. The same precious faith. We, we, have, we have no more and no less than any other believer from any other country or any other culture. And because we have Jesus Christ in common, we have all things in common. And many years earlier, you remember Peter was, was part of the gospel going into other cultures. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 12, when uh, he was explaining to the Jewish believers that were there why he took 
Jesus, not to just Jews, but he went to the, non, the, the, the Gentiles. He said this, and the Spirit told me to go with them and to make no distinction. You see, God doesn't make any distinctions. Jew, Gentile, white, black, red, yellow, whatever. God makes no distinctions. And all of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus, no matter what culture we're from, no matter what color of skin, no matter what ethnic background we have, we have a common, we have a like precious faith and it has been given to us. This faith is something that's been given to you. It's not something that you worked up. You see, people try to work, you can't work up faith. Faith is a gift that comes from God. And so where do we stand? We stand in this common faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, you have what the Bible calls imputed righteousness. Notice he says, by the righteousness of God. Imputed simply means to have something that's accredited or deposited in your account. It's like putting money in your... It's like God has taken the righteousness of Jesus Christ and he's put it into every one of us's spiritual bank account. You got a spiritual bank account. Well, God took the righteousness, what, his perfect life. None of us, can any of us live? No, we can't live a perfect life. But Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. He was righteous. He fulfilled the righteous demands of the law. And what God did in, when we put our faith in is he took the righteousness of Christ and he put it down on our account. Uh, when Adam sinned, um, it says that his sin was imputed to every one of us in, in Romans 5.12. And then when Jesus died on that cross, all the sins of this world were put on him. 1 Peter 2.24 uh, says that. It says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. He's quoting Isaiah 53 that I preached on uh, just this last Sunday. Yes. When you are saved, your sins are not only forgiven, and not only are you given eternal life, but even more than that takes place. Think about it. The very righteousness of Jesus Christ is credited to your account. Do you see that we have obtained are like precious faith by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But, you know, it's a burden on my heart. Uh, George Barna does a lot of Christian surveys. I just read recently that in one of his surveys, just in the last few years, nine out of ten Americans believe that Jesus, that Jesus Christ was a real historical person. Praise the Lord. I, that kind of shock, shocked me. But then there's the other, other part of the survey. Unfortunately, only about 50% of them believe that he was God. And if, folks, if Jesus was not God, every one of us is going to spend eternity in hell. Mm -hmm. Because the only way that Jesus could live a perfect life was he was, total, he was fully human, born of the Virgin Mary. He was human like you and me. When, he, when you cut, he, cut him, he bled. He had feelings. He got hungry. He was human. But he didn't have sin because he was God. He was fully man. He was fully God. But only half of Americans, half, nine out of ten Americans believe that Jesus was a historic, but only half of them believe that he was God. Unfortunately, listen to the words of Jesus, John 10, 30. What do you say? I and my Father are one. What are you saying? He's saying he's God. Actually, that's why the Jews wanted him killed. <laughs> because they said he blasphemed because he called himself God. Jesus was God. So we've... We've, the righteousness of Jesus has been given to us. But here's, here's another one to get excited about. 
How do, where do you stand today? Where, where do you stand? You, are multiply, you have multiplied grace and peace. Notice verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and, our God and Savior Jesus our Lord. This refers to God's free and unmerited favor that's poured out on people just like you and me. And it's only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and our response to His grace and mercy that we can be made at peace with God. And you know, persecution's coming, folks. It's not already here. I mean, we've seen this. It's really sad. Even in this pandemic, in so many places, have Christians and churches been treated like gambling casinos and other places? So many places. Persecution, folks, is coming if it's not already here. But did you know this? Throughout history, we know, we know for a fact that Christianity has always advanced and moved forward when it's being attacked and when, when persecution comes. That's when the church grow, grew the most. Look at China. They, when the communists took over China, Mao Zedong, they kicked out all the missionaries. Forty years later, when China opened back up, they found out that the church went underground and today... Depending on the estimates, there are more followers of Jesus Christ in communist China than there are in the United States. Depending on whose stats you look at. The highest figure is 150 million. 150 million Christians in communist China. They put, they closed churches, they put thousands literally of pastors in prison and what happened the church just multiplied and grew that's what happens so where do we stand today where do we stand he reminds us here not only has the righteousness of Jesus been imputed to us but but we have multiplied grace we don't just have grace and peace he says we have it multiplied 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 so know where you stand. Finally, know what to do. You see, it's good for us to know our position in Christ. But we have to live it out in practice. And he, he mentions it three ways. And this is what I want to challenge you with as we close this morning. There's three ways that we, uh, what we need to know to do. First is we're to unleash God's power in our lives. Notice what he says in verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. All things. Folks, all things means all. <laughs> it means all things. You know, we already have everything that we need in this life, as I said at the beginning, and everything that we need to grow in godliness, you already have it. You, you, don't, you don't need another book, folks. We don't need another seminar. We don't need another blessing. We don't need another experience. If you've got Jesus, you've got him all. <laughs> If you've got the Holy Spirit, you've got all the Holy Spirit. You don't, you don't need something else. That's what Peter is saying here. That's what God's Word is saying. You have all you need right now to be all that God wants you to be. Listen to Romans 8.32. It says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, with Christ, also freely give us all things? You have everything you need. You have everything. And when you're saved, you, you're, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. God gives you a spiritual gift. Are you using your spirit? Every one of us here has a If you're saved, you have a spiritual gift. Are you using it? Don't set it aside. Use it for God's glory. The Bible says we're complete in Him. Colossians 2.10 says we're complete in Him. And so unleash God's power. Unleash God's power in your life. Set it free. But secondly... Utilize his promises. Notice what he calls them. By which we have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Utilize God's promises. God's promises are exceedingly great and precious. John Bunyan, who spent most of his life uh, in prison for his faith, if you know anything about um, history, this is what he said. The pathway of life is strewn so thickly with the promises of God 
that it is impossible to take one step without treading on one of the promises. Aren't you glad that God keeps all of his promises? As humans, folks, if you follow me long enough, all you have to do is ask my wife. <laughs> well, not, not just her, ask some of my kids, my four daughters. Folks, sometimes we don't keep our promises, do we? We try to, but I want to tell you, your heavenly Father, God, keeps his promises. And this book is full of exceedingly great and precious promises. Psalm 145, verse 13 says this, Your kingdom, God, is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. I cried this morning when I woke up and my third daughter, sweet Natalie, she sent me a little text, and she said, Dad, have a great last Sunday of 2020. God is in control. <laughs> I tell you, that blesses you when one of your kids, grown kids, does something like that. God, he's in control. <laughs> it sure doesn't look like it, does it? In a lot of ways, but he's on the throne. Don't forget that. Finally, we're to undertake God's partnership. Notice what he says, that we're partners. That, that this, God has given us his divine, we're partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. You see, when we unleash God's power in our lives, when we utilize the promises that God has given us, we're able to partner with God in so many amazing ways. A partaker here just simply means to share. We're share with, we share with God. I, I like what Henry Blackaby said so many years ago when we wrote the book Experiencing God. Here's what he said. Just look around you and see where God is, work. God is at work and then join God. <laughs> join God in what he's doing. Just look around you. God's working. Find out where God is working in your sphere of influence and in your life and just join him in it. That's what we're, we're, we're to partner with him in it. It says we've escaped. I love that word there. Brother David, I love this. He says, escaped here simply means to successfully get away from something. <laughs> That's bad. And what does he say we get away from? Uh, corruption. You know what that word corrupt means? Decomposing something that's decomposing and rotting away. We have, folks, we, we have escaped the corruption awful corruption that is in this world. Aren't you glad that God has made a way of escape? Let me just ask some questions in closing this morning. Do you know who you are? You're a sinner, a saint, a servant, a sent one. Do you know where you stand today? The Bible says you've obtained faith. You have the righteousness of God put to your account. You have multiplied grace and peace in your life. You know what to do now? You want to grow? Unleash God's power, utilize his promises, and undertake God's partnership in your life to join him. You know, I sense time is short. Not just in this service. But, you know, I don't know if I'm about to die. I don't know. Yeah, may, maybe that happens to you when you have three funerals in three week, weeks um, and when you take part in it. But, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and I don't know when Jesus is coming back. If, if somebody tells you they do know, they're, they're lying because the Bible said nobody knows. <laughs> but I do believe he's coming soon. But, but I have this in, increasing burning in my heart to share the good news of Jesus Christ with as, many, with as many people as I can and to call Christ followers to, to, to be, to join me in doing that. And that's what I want to invite you to do today. I, I want to stand for Christ. I want to stand against the anti-Christian sentiments that's in our society and in our culture. And I want to tell you, I will continue to preach the full counsel of God's word without compromise. If you come to this church, and you come, to, I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God. I, I'm reminded of Martin Luther, the great reformer. This is what he said. 
when he was confronted, when they wanted him to recant his 99 thesis that he nailed on that wall. He, he said this, I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God, amen. <laughs> and I want to say, who's with me? <laughs> who's with me this morning? Who's with me? Are you willing to take a stand today? Probably need a few seconds or a minute before you, you make a commitment to, to gather and to grow and to give and to go, but just personalize these statements this morning. I will gather with God's people. I will grow in my faith. I will give what has been given to me. I will go with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or maybe is there one of these G's that you need some help in? How many here need to step up in, gathering, in, in your gathering to be more faithful in gathering with God's people? Anyone here today need to step up in growing in your faith? Do you need to raise your level of giving to the Lord? Do, do, you, do you want to do a better job of, of going and, and being out there and, and sharing your faith with other people? So I'm just asking you, who's ready to stand for Christ? No matter what happens, who's ready to stand for Christ? And if so, I'll uh, ask you just in a moment to stand with me. But if you're not, don't stand. <laughs> don't stand. But if you are, stand. We're going to sing our hymn of invitation, our response hymn. We won't do it like we, you know, used to do. But I will be here after the service is over to talk to any of you or pray with you if something is on your heart. I'm going to sing this great old hymn, Christmas hymn, Thou didst live thy, leave thy throne. But uh, let me pray. And, and then if you, are, if you want to stand with me, like what I've said today, you stand and we will sing.